Sebastian, oh, how you doing, man? Hey, Doug, how's it going? Excellent. Are you guys, uh, you must be in Colorado now. Yes, sir. We're actually in Boulder right oh. now. We are uh, sitting on top of a mountain in this beautiful house. Well, let's let's just jump in, man. How's the, how's the tour going? How are things going? You've been out there a little over a week now or so? Yeah, things have been going great. Um, we're, we're all here. You got Zach here. He's a drummer. Zach, you want to say hi? What's up, man? Zach, what's up, man? What up, dude? I'm Tom. Hi, Tom. How you doing? Up now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah cool. man. The uh, the tour has been really great. I, I think almost every show has been uh, either sold out or close to sold out, and it's it's just been really awesome. Good crowds coming out. A lot of good people. Both Ruby the Hatchet and Elder have been slaying it every single night. So that is awesome. That is great to hear. I've been a Thank fan you. of all three of you bands for a while now and uh it's great to see you guys all out on the same show that is very cool you know ruby the hatchet especially it's like how do you even label that band <laughs> you know it's 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 uh they have such a vintage uh, uh sound i kind of label them as like a, a darker deep purple but but they're just really really awesome really good people too so we're just ecstatic to be on the road with them what happened i mean it's like you guys are are all back in that classic rock Black Sabbath era again. It's it's really crazy how it all came back around, you know? Well, I mean, things are cyclical, right? Yeah. Like, I think I, I think a good example is, like, with, with talking about Peter and everything, is he kind of lived through the whole uh, 80s metal boom and then the, like, rejection of, of a lot of the overproduced stuff in the 90s as things kind of went back to a garage sound and then kind of shift to the 2000s and whatnot and, and the high production stuff comes back again yep. and now you have a lot of underground stoner doom desert rock bands uh just just getting out there mostly doing stuff themselves you know recording in their own basement i was gonna say i think the ability to kind of diy record stuff has really shifted the focus you know back when it was everything had to be like a high production uh by studios i think there's probably like some influence from them to evolve and sound right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but then now it's like i think a lot of people are realizing you know if you're learning guitar you're like man the pentatonic low riffs are like the most fun to play yeah. and that's like black sabbath you know yep so you're like well let me get my buddies together and let's jam on this and we have the ability to record this at home so like let's be a band right now i don't know if i can pinpoint your average fan who's coming to your shows are, are younger older a mix it's it's definitely a mix uh yeah. we see all ages come to the shows i mean just a few nights ago i looked in the front row and there were some you know, like older people uh and then just you know right behind them there's people in their 20s people in the 30s like everybody's coming out we it's see a lot of buffalo. parents bringing children yeah you know? in buffalo yeah. there was a uh, dad with his son on his shoulders like awesome. in the crowd that's kind of how i envisioned it yeah or, or was hoping but i wasn't sure that's what was happening exactly you know because let's face it the radio airplay is pretty limited for the style but on the other hand mm -hmm. it's it would work too, you know. Um, it's not like it's offensive. In fact, I think most people would like it if they heard it in the right setting. But I think radio is interesting because our fan base doesn't seem to discover new music by listening to the radio largely. I, I guess I don't know how true that is. I feel like that's true. I feel like a yeah. lot of our fans tend to be the folks that really kind of go digging on their own yeah. or find the band that they like and say, who are they touring with? Yeah. Or maybe you let me look at the label they're on. Yeah. So there's a little more like detective work. And I think that's why some of these fans can be so hardcore because it's yeah. like they discovered it. They, yeah. they curated their favorite bands by really kind of digging and seeing where it led them. And uh, another big way that is spreading is just simply by word of mouth. You just see uh, online on, on Facebook groups and Instagram, whatever. There's always people asking, oh, which band should I check out if I like this certain style of music? And then somebody will just comment, post 10 different bands. Yeah, and, you know, and that probably goes to the camaraderie that is behind this kind of umbrella genre. I mean, it's genres are a double-edged sword. Yes, it can be helpful. 
mm-hmm. in having like some shared language when talking amongst each other. But I think it can go too far where it becomes like kind of gate kept at a certain point where it's like, okay, this is no longer a fun word to describe and help explain a shared musical interest. And now it's kind of a way to like maybe protect and distinguish, but it's like, I yeah. think that's the double-edged sword nature of a genre tag. One of my favorite bands is Clutch. You know, they don't need the labels. They don't need radio. They they have such a, a, an amazing fan base and they just keep putting out one great record after another. They've created their own entity and I think they've really created a, yes. a good model. I think there's something really dope about a band like clutch that can have that following kind of despite like social media media in general it's like it feels kind of like this sci-fi world we're getting into where it's like everyone is so kind of plugged into this shared kind of network that when you see a band that can cultivate a following like clutch just on their own it feels kind of extra rebellious because of that well I, is that kind of a, a route you guys are looking to take yourself in a way i think you kind of have to play like both sides you know you want to kind of cultivate that underground cult following that can exist without like social media but also you kind of shoot yourself in the foot if you don't try to just reach as many people as you can you yeah know? i think it's just a little bit different for uh younger bands to if we don't have that social media there there just won't be as much of a following you know we just have to work with it at, to a certain extent yeah. at the same time we are trying to create our own sort of like cult following have you been playing sunken city live oh yeah Anyone? it's been it's been going over really well i think cool. people have been absolutely loving it we're so excited to release this new record we put this single out a little bit early just because of this tour but we have new music videos in the works what's kind of been cool is like i've seen a few fans already knowing the words to sunken city wow. yeah, i'm like that's what i'm talking about man like yep. you just dropped it and it's already kind of working its way around oh, i love the song I, I love that it's super heavy in the music but then you got some nice melody going on i think we'd like to combine heaviness with those melodic vocals because you know, we, we all come from metal backgrounds, and, uh, and that's just what we love. But uh, to have something that's a little bit melodic on top of that, that sort of catches the ear of the listener. And at the same time, it's it's also really fun to combine heaviness with sort of a happy major sound. Anything could be heavy. I think a lot of it lies in the groove itself, you know? Yeah, I also think that, like, what we do is, I I think what I like to do is is try to create, like, this pop song feel in some ways. Really what we all try to do, I think, with our songwriting. If there's something that can feel familiar or melodic and catchy, but then you can also introduce, like, high gain, heavy distortion, like, solos, like, Zach Shrek on drums, it's like... How can you sneak in these kind of metal influences while also retaining something that is maybe comfortable for someone who isn't into that scene? Yeah. By doing that, it creates a little bit of an open door for a new fan to the genre. You guys have a tough job in a lot of ways, <laughs> keeping those fans and, and keeping them happy and getting them to come back. And It's tough. And, the, and of course, the pandemic. I mean, what did you guys, were you just writing during that, that time period or what were you doing? We actually started streaming on Twitch quite a bit. My wife mixes all our records, does live sound for a living, and she kind of got us set up in our jam space uh, to start streaming. We just got on there the first few times. It was definitely a little weird, you know, without people in front of you. But, you know, we just ran through our tunes or made up, just jammed on the spot. And eventually we were like playing Dungeons and Dragons and having cooking streams and like all this other stuff outside of the music as well. And that was a great way to really connect with a lot of the the hardcore fans and keep them over the course of the, the few years there. With that, guys, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll get this out on all the social media and everything. And uh, we'll talk again when the album's closer to coming out. If something comes up in the road, you guys got my number. Yeah, awesome. Of course. All right, guys. Thank you so much, man. Hey, thank you so much. Have a great one, guys. Be safe.